So first, thank you everyone to come uh, here instead of going for lunch. I know that the time is not the best, so I really appreciate everyone there. I'm going to talk today uh, about uh, what we have learned uh, when uh, we have been developing our, our, our Enlightenment Foundation library toolkits for wearable devices and what kind of experience uh, we, knew, we have learned on optimizing for uh, like low battery usage, basically. So I will go through quickly on uh, like background because that's not really uh, so interesting. Uh, I am Cedric Bai. I work for Samsung uh, Open Source Group on this toolkit for now a few years. Uh, <clears throat> this toolkit has been created for Enlightenment 17, which has been released a few years ago now, and our. Uh, it has been in development since 97, so it's not really a recent technology. Uh, it was the first window manager of GNOME. Uh, it has been a full rewrite uh, since 2001. Uh, and it has been built from the ground up, from the idea that uh, there will never be a year of the Linux desktop, but that embedded was where Linux is going to shine. Uh, was 14 years later, oh, it's pretty accurate as maybe more than 14 years now, won't oh, So <clears throat> we have designed everything there for embedded device. And when we started, there was no toolkit that did uh, match this goal and need. And today we still do uh, think that our enlightenment uh, EFL, EFL library that uh, come with enlightenment is best targeting or embedded device. Uh, <clears throat> so today, Enlightenment is number, revision is 21. Uh, it does use EFL completely. Uh, that means in scene graph, main loop, and all the optimization we have been putting into EFL. So Enlightenment itself uh, can be used on wearable device. We do at Samsung use it for uh, our smartwatch. They are actually running uh, X and a window manager and a composite manager. Uh, which is Enlightenment. Uh, <clears throat> we are working quite actively on the Wayland support, so uh, it is uh, today also a Wayland, it does support Wayland client to connect to it. It has multiple backends, so X, frame buffer, DRM. It is highly customizable, of course, because uh, it's used on so many different devices that we really need to be able to have very, very different uh, UI and our interaction with user, so uh, it requires profile, module, and theme to be or to, fa to to match Samsung and or need an embedded device. And <coughs> our base platform now for targeting performance is the Raspberry Pi 3, and the Raspberry Pi uh, we are today are doing better on performance than our Western does. So that gives you an idea of what what we're targeting, and and we are only now going to get better from there. Um, so, what is this Enlightenment Foundation library? Uh, the community spent a decade writing a, a modern graphic toolkit. It's uh, a mix and match of LGPL and BSD license. Uh, there is nobody that owns all of it. Uh, nobody can change the license, so uh, that's what you get today, and it's not going to change. Uh, it's highly focused on embedded, as I've been saying until now, and it's uh, really where, where it makes sense. Uh, the first release of EFL itself was in 2011, so 10 years after the development started, basically. <coughs> we are trying to have a stable, long-term API and ABI. We are, for every release, doing ABI report, checking that we don't break things. Uh, bugs may happen, but uh, we do take or our ABI and API stability quite highly. And we are now on a three month release cycle. We're trying to keep that. It's not so easy, uh, but that's like kind of our goal and where we are, what we are doing. So the state of EFL today, uh, as it was written for Enlightenment and the window manager, it has evolved to actually write any kind of application. Uh, it has its own rendering library, its own scene graph on top of it. It's really optimized for reducing CPU, GPU memory, and battery usage. That's a, that's a very core uh, focus on Lightning and EFL. 
But still, we have full support for uh, international language, so UTF-8, or left to right, right to left uh, writings. That's like that's a given. It's, mo it's necessary in any modern toolkit. Uh, we do also have the ability to change the scale of the UI depending on the input size, so that your button are always something you can click on with your finger. Uh, we also scale depending on the font size and every readable element depending on the DPI of the screen. So all of that is taken into account when we push something to the screen. Uh, we support also accessibility. <coughs> we have a fully themable uh, toolkit, so you don't need to rewrite your own button. You just provide a theme for your button for the, whatever device you are doing, which is what you want when you do embedded device. You really want to customize the UI to fit your needs. So the goal is that if you are running an EFL application, when we look, even if we are making the toolkit and we look at the screen, we should not be able to tell if it's EFL or not, because you should be able to change everything you want on the visual or very easily. Uh, <clears throat> the minimal set of uh, dependency for the full toolkit will lead to eight megabyte uh, library. And that's like including our all the widgets, uh, even a small capability to display videos and stuff like that. Some people have pushed it uh, further, uh, but that's less functional. So the reason why we care for uh, optimization so much, uh, the first thing is that Moore's law doesn't apply on battery. Your battery doesn't get like twice the capacity every two years, that never happen. Uh, I mean, it will be amazing if it does, but that's not the case. Uh, memory bandwidth uh, also doesn't increase uh, following more slow, so uh, that's also another problem. Uh, mostly because all rendering operations are constrained by memory bandwidth, so that's constrained also uh, what we can do. And anyway, more slow is kind of uh, slowing down now, so we should not bet so much more on more slow for the long term anyway. Also, as we focus on embedded device, uh, this CPU also don't get more general purpose power. They get more IP block around that do some specific tasks like decoding a JPEG or, or just doing something very specific. And taking advantage of that uh, usually reduce your uh, energy consumption but doesn't give you much more uh, performance. So there is all of that to take into account uh, from all point of view as doing numbered device or uh, toolkit. Also, many of the embedded device that we are working with have actually less memory than a low-end phone. Or you buy a low-end phone for $70, you can buy a f an oven or microwave for $100. If you did expect to have the same CPU into that free into that oven, it's not going to happen. So we we have devices like refrigerator, oven, dishwasher, washing machine, home automation that actually have less um, CPU, less memory than uh, <coughs> than a phone. So we have to take that into account. And even on a low end phone, uh, your native application, if they spare memory for the web runtime, because people love to go on website, uh, it's always best because web browsers are like memory hog. They just consume so much memory. So having the native application not taking memory for you from there is also something where we, we take care of. And in general, if your application is optimized uh, for this kind of environment, it will get better for the, use, the user experience. Uh, and it also increases the multitasking. So on Android, you kind of notice, when, especially when you are on the lower end, uh, when you switch from one application to the other, it's usually the application is fully restarting every time because there is not enough memory to actually run the application. So multitasking is a really poor experience on the lower end. If your application are optimized for, for memory, CPU, and all of that, you end up being able to not kill the application in the background and just keep them running. So OpenGL, for example, is a big user of memory. It's actually very common to have 40 megabytes of memory just taken by your OpenGL context. So when you are doing a phone with 512 megabytes, uh, you end up with like not so many applications you can run. So that's why we have a software engine uh, for most applications, because you don't need OpenGL for just a button to click. So 
that gives you the idea of why we care for optimization. So current state of optimization uh, in EFL are, is mostly driven by the screen size and your theme. So the bigger your screen, the more you need pix map and stuff to put on screen, so more, the more memory you need. Uh, that's the first uh, kind of driving force on your toolkit. The other thing is uh, we are currently doing better than Android. Uh, that's why Samsung is using Tizen uh, on smartwatch, is because we have a better battery life on it than if we were under using Android wearable. Uh, and that's a side effect on actually of EFL and Enlightenment being more efficient on, on the energy usage of, of the, for doing the same thing, basically. Uh, yeah, as I say, we fit in eight megabytes. Uh, you can actually have the scene graph, the main loop, and the very minimum uh, set of like graphic primitive for one megabyte, but you don't have the toolkit for that memory. There is no requirement on the GPU, and you can actually make a desktop run in 48 megabyte of RAM at 300 megahertz uh, with one core. Uh, that's, you can run enlightenment in that context. You will be able to run one application, but you can. As a desktop profile, it does work. And there is no trouble for that in software with no GPU. So that gives you an idea of where we are today uh, with EFL. <coughs> so energy efficiency, why? Well, the first thing is get the most of your battery life. I mean, if your watch has 10 hours of battery life or 13 hours of battery life, it makes a difference. With 13 hours, you will be going to bed uh, and your watch will be still usable. It, with 10 hours, your battery run out before you go to bed, pretty much. So being more efficient the battery usage uh, gives your device a longer uh, and more usable case. The second one is uh, also, if you are more efficient on energy usage, you are dissipate, dissipating less heat, so uh, you, you don't have uh, all the problem of like burning people, uh, which sometimes we make mistakes there. But uh, that's, that's something we, we need to we care about. It does allow for thinner device because, well, you can actually have the same battery life, but you can use a smaller battery than a competing device, and you have a thinner device. And so designers also like to go this way too. Oh, uh, so that's just what I'm going to say. Designers like to have more freedom on like what kind of package they can go with. And in general, uh, electric devices today are one of the growing uh, energy consumer uh, in house. So keeping that under control is kind of good, I think. So how do we do that? Well. It actually happened that when you optimize for classical things like speed and memory and network use, you actually already start to optimize for battery. I will just cover after that so like what we do specifically to optimize for battery usage. And there is also actually a thing that you can do into your visual design to optimize your uh, battery use. It's kind of interesting to, to see j down to uh, what you display on screen as an effect which is kind of obvious when you say it, but you don't maybe realize it. So the first thing is that if you optimize for speed, it basically means that you are doing things more efficiently. So you're avoiding unnecessary computation. And obviously, unnecessary computation does consume energy. So it's better to optimize for speed as a starting point because that's like the easiest thing. Uh, it also applies even to GPU. So GPU are really fast at doing things, so you may not notice because you already have your 60 frames per second, but optimizing the usage of the GPU is saving battery. Uh, if you, you will still have your 60 frames per second, but if you only update on screen what has changed since the last frame, well, you are saving energy there. If you only trigger animation at the speed of your display, it's obviously something also uh, that will save energy because you don't waste time doing something that is not necessary. Uh, and in general, GPU, the simpler the GPU shader you do, all the better it is for your battery usage because, well, as I say for the CPU before, if you don't do something unnecessary, it's, it's better for energy efficiency. Uh, all of that is really 
classical optimization work. Uh, what is interesting with that is that we already have a lot of debugging tool for uh, doing benchmark and to analyze where we are spending too much time on the uh, performance side. So you can use like cold grind, uh, you can use uh, Perf to do all this optimization without having the need to any special tool and try to measure energy at the output of your device. If you start with optimizing for speed, you will be gaining energy efficiency. So, yeah. <clears throat> we do use actually the Raspberry Pi for, as a target for speed optimization because if we are able to run fine and fast on the Raspberry Pi, it gives us also a good in that we are fine on the battery usage. We don't need to have like, do the measurement for battery usage all the time uh, because that's kind of a cumbersome thing to do. Uh, for then the next step for optimizing is to optimize for memory usage. Oh, that's, this one is not so obvious, uh, but it actually really helps to be uh, using less memory. Uh, one of the things that your memory, accessing mem main memory is costing more energy than like, accessing the CPU cache. So every time you fetch something from the main memory, you consume more energy than if it was. Uh, in your CPU. So when you have a smaller application, you have more chance to be in cache. So saving memory is actually something that also saves energy. That's something that people don't really see the link first. But once you explain it, I think it's pretty obvious that uh, if you don't do, don't use a necessary memory, you are going to be more efficient in energy. So here again, it's classical. Uh, in improvement that you do. You improve cache locality. Uh, you do linear access instead of random access. And we have developed for EFL a, a technique that is uh, a kind of copy of and write uh, in user space. So we do duplicate, most of the objects on screen have a lot of property that are the same. It's really like, there is really a common thing on the screen. So by taking advantage of that, we are able to uh, reduce by 5% or uh, by 10% our uh, memory usage. And this lead actually to a 5% speed increase. Well, because cache usage was improved. And side effect, it does also improve our energy efficiency overall. So this logic is, uh, goes pretty well there. Again, it's very nice because optimizing for memory use, there is a lot of tools that do great things. So you can actually run yourself uh, massive to actually know uh, where you are spending too, using too much memory and try to cut that. So that's a, a next tool to use to bring your energy efficiency uh, up. The next one is network use. Uh, so most applications today are actually connected. Uh, and so the network use is quite important. And as you send more data over the network, it's more likely to have lost packet. And lost packet is, again, it's an unnecessary loss, but you have to re-emit it. So the more data you transmit on the network, the more likely you are to lose data, and the more likely you have to retransmit it. So being efficient and sending as little data as you need over the network is uh, quite a good optimization also to do in your application. <coughs> the other way around is actually for download. Uh, it's where it's really tricky because download is usually in application something you do as a prefetch and you don't really know if the user is going to need all your download. So you may over download something and that's where it's kind of tricky because you, you really have to find barrier between prefetching too much and being wrong into what the user need and waste battery on that, or too little and having a poor user experience. So this one is difficult to actually uh, like give you like strong rules on what to do. It's something that has to be adjusted by every application, and it's where you will be losing energy and efficiency. Um, Still, there is some, fun, some few things you can do is group all your download together and do go back into doing no wireless for as long as you can. Uh, because wireless protocol usually have a high energy mode where they do all the transmission and they have a suspend mode or like idle mode, which is really low energy. And you want to be able to go back into that mode as soon as possible. So if you do like, ping the network every millisecond, you are going to screw up on that, and it's never going to go down in energy uh, usage. 
The issue with that is there is no daemon or anywhere in the system, anything that kind of synchronize all applications. So on multitask situation, uh, there is nothing you can do today uh, to reduce your uh, network usage and your battery waste there. It's kind of, sorry, that's how it is. So the next step for battery usage and to optimize there is to rely on the kernel, actually, because the kernel is the one which, uh, which shows the clock and the voltage of your CPU, and it does that uh, by trying to figure out what you are going to do. So it's, it's kind of a, a hard task because the kernel has no idea what you are doing. And he's like putting his finger in the air and trying to see where the wind is going and coming. And it's basically an oracle. And the thing is that for years it has failed really badly. Uh, so that's why there is this energy aware scheduler uh, work that is coming on, on the kernel which try to improve uh, the, the situation and make the scheduler, the CPU frequency driver and the CPU idler driver work all together uh, to actually get things right. But even then, uh, you need to fix user space because the kernel is only looking at the history of your task. And if your task is doing random things in the past, I mean, if it's doing waiting on I.O., then drawing a frame, then waiting on some other I.O., and doing a small frame, then do a big frame, the kernel has no idea of what your process is doing, and it has no chance of actually choosing the right frequency, uh, the right voltage for your CPU. And that's where you will be wasting either uh, you will have not the right frame, frame rate you want, or you will have uh, use, uh, memory bat uh, battery usage uh, going up because you will have a CPU running too fast for nothing to do. So <clears throat> the scheduler is being fixed. It's going into a direction where uh, you won't be able to give an int directly to the kernel by saying, oh, now I'm doing rendering, now I'm doing this interactive task. Uh, it will be our bookkeeping per process, and there is uh, most likely going to be a, a new sched deadline infrastructure that gives the possibility for interactive tasks to actually be properly uh, scheduled by the system. And so the idea is that the user space has to break things apart and have process thread uh, that are actually dedicated to uh, one thing. So that's where we're going. So I'm going to quickly go over what is a scene graph because it's actually where uh, the main optimization is going. So the scene graph is basically a map, a graph of everything you have to draw on screen. It's not the immediate rendering, it's not the code that will draw things on screen, it's just a bookkeeping of everything that needs to be displayed on screen and how to display them. It does allow a general view of your application from the inside of the toolkit. And as it has a global view of the thing, it gives it the possibility to do global optimization. So it can deduplicate your data, it can uh, cut out things that don't need to be displayed on screen, or uh, it can limit texture and a shader switch, it can, uh, it can also uh, properly schedule all the rendering tasks later on because it knows exactly what needs to be drawn uh, on screen. So EFL first scene graph, that was 10 years ago, uh, well, we didn't foresee that it was going to be multi-core in embedded device. I mean, 10 years ago, there was not even multi-core on your desktop. So we did start with one main thread, one main loop, and everything was into that main loop. And <coughs> you have a bunch of tasks which have different property. So you will have compute intensive tasks which will be preparing our, the, the, the data to actually uh, know where to draw things on screen. You will have memory bound uh, operation which are actually all the blit are mostly memory bound. Uh, and you have walking all over the place uh, code which is for layouting and uh, preparing uh, the scene graph rendering. So all of that was in the main loop. Uh, we have seen evolve to this kind of, of case where we have uh, 
two threads, basically. And we start drawing uh, in the threads separately. It's, it's actually quite, quite good with uh, where things are going, uh, but still the kernel uh, may have a hard time figuring out what is going on there with the main loop. And we can actually help it more by grouping things together better. So we are going to this direction where we are grouping all the span line computation, which is the CPU intensive task for uh, your shape, for your rectangle and everything to be moved uh, into specific thread that will be dedicated to a uh, CPU intensive task. All the memory, the, the memory bound uh, drawing operation that does the bleed and, uh, or just a mem copy there will be in, in their own thread. This one doesn't need to actually be duplicated because it's a memory bound. So if it's memory bound, having two thread memory bound make no sense. So that's why there is only one green uh, box there. But the yellow is something that should be scaling uh, quite fine by the number of cores you have on your system. Uh, and that's pretty much where we're trying to go. And that's uh, what the main cost on computation for uh, user interface toolkit is today. Our most applications don't do much. They just like fetch data from the network, from a database, do some stuff, display some, and, and they change the UI. And then it's the UI that does all the CPU, the GPU intensive task. So optimizing that part only is actually saving a lot, a, a lot of uh, battery usage and energy efficiency uh, into the system. So the main price that we are going to pay with this move is that it does increase our memory usage because we need more thread. And every thread has their own stack. Uh, there, is, there is an increase in complexity that goes with it. Uh, it's more difficult to get right. I mean, race condition and all these kind of new bugs that show up because you're doing a thread. It's not really like new things, but it does come with a cost to go with this kind of architecture. Uh, the thing that we're trying to do is that we're trying to put all these uh, risky things are uh, inside the toolkit, and we still push for application to not be multi-thread, or uh, to have as much helper in the in the toolkit that you don't need to write your own database processing or uh, in a thread because we already have a data model that does connect to your database correctly from a thread and doesn't. Or have any trouble there. <coughs> the reason why we need to use thread and we don't have like an int uh, to get to the kernel is because obviously the kernel cannot trust uh, user space application. Even the schedule sched line uh, API required to be root. Uh, so it will be a system daemon that will actually say, okay, this application, this thread of this application is actually the one that should uh, be the rendering thread. So there is a big part of the system that is not there yet. There is, the sked deadline is not upstream. There is no daemon in the system to do so, but at the same time, building all the thread infrastructure in the toolkit is already taking us quite some time anyway. So by the time we are done there, all they may be done on the system side. So it's something that you have to, we have to take that uh, now and to make it now. And what is also interesting is the same kind of uh, pipeline actually work quite well with Vulkan. So you will not do exactly the same computation in the yellow boxes, but it may be actually something that you will be doing or, uh, in parallel to build all the queue, the command queue that you are going to push to Vulkan. So going into that direction for us is actually something that in, should enable us to be able to uh, have the same architecture for a Vulkan uh, rendering. It doesn't work well with OpenGL, obviously, because OpenGL and Thread, that's. Uh, okay, I have been going like really fast on this. I'm guessing I'm kind of hungry and I want food or something like that. Uh, if you have any question, uh, just like, you should have raised your hand. Um, uh, so the last thing and the last optimization, which is I find it quite funny, is optimize, optimizing your visual design. Uh, it's something that, well, your designer don't want to hear about, but if your screen is black uh, and you have an AMOLED screen, well, it doesn't consume any energy. So black design saves a lot. 
uh, it does save so much that uh, actually it's on an AMOLED uh, device, it will be way bigger win than any of the optimization I have talked before. Uh, so that's, that's something to be said. Uh, of course, people like to have white things, so I mean, it's, it's a trend, so let's waste energy there. Anyway, uh, other things is, uh, as I've been saying, we can do partial update, and it does help on energy uh, saving. But if your designer loves to have full screen animation, think like slide from the left to right, up and down, well, that's a full screen animation. That means no partial update, so full screen energy use. Uh, some screen also have an uh, integrated frame buffer. So that's something that we have in many watch, actually, is that there is a small frame buffer inside the screen of the smartwatch itself. And that can like, keep uh, usually gray level of display in the screen itself. That does enable to just like completely suspend the system, uh, the, the stock, and save quite a lot of battery too. Same story, if you are just displaying a watch, it works well, but if someone starts to want to have blinky things of different color, it doesn't work well. So <coughs> that's a, another nice optimization there. And also, it's, again, it's kind of obvious, but your designer is having fun in Photoshop and it has this 20 layer uh, user interface with all this bitmap and all this transparency and stuff going on. And it's, it's quite complex. And the more complex is uh, all your layers and yeah, there's nothing you can do on the, tool on the toolkit there to reduce the number of layers you want to draw on screen. So I think simpler design is actually more efficient. It's kind of an obvious thing to say, but it's something to keep in mind. And well, if the simplest design you could think of, it's rectangle and vertical gradient, because a vertical gradient is just a series of memset that's pretty nice to optimize. And a gradient is just, uh, and a rectangle is just one big mem set. So that's, that's maybe the easiest uh, design, like pushing this, the idea to the limit, because obviously you don't want to do that. But a given idea of like, sometimes the biggest win is on the design itself. Uh, because any of this optimization is basically going to give much more uh, gain than any of the thing I speak before. So that's kind of a sorry state, I guess. But it kind of makes sense. I mean, if you need to do something, it's kind of forcing you to spend the energy to do it. If you don't need to do it, it's a save. And as I have been going through things quite quickly today, uh, I am actually done. So if you have any question or anything, uh, just raise your hands. Otherwise, uh, could be lunchtime. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you repeat? Oh yeah. So the question is, uh, can I elaborate on the copy and write technique uh, that we use uh, in EFL? So we have a, a two macro system where uh, you write, you in your structure, you just actually write the subfield as const. And uh, we have a macro that will actually uh, duplicate when you start writing on it. And there is a macro to close, uh, so it gives you a field that you can actually write in it. And at the end of the macro, it actually uh, gives you a chance to uh, copy back that in memory or to find another field that has the same value in another object and use that instead. And it will be reusing a pointer that was already allocated for that purpose, or uh, deduplicating like right on the flight. Uh, so all read access are, are done like normal code because it's a, just a const pointer that is the normal pointer to your structure. But uh, all the write access uh, have to be put inside this uh, two macro. And it's, it worked quite well for Toolkit because we have a lot of property that are accessed all over the place in read, read mode and we have really like, like one or two spots where you do actually write things back. So it doesn't complexify your code too much. And 
it gives us quite some benefits. So the problem with Raspbian and most old Debian is that our package and dependency are quite old. Uh, so the easiest uh, setup is actually to go with uh, an Arch Linux. Uh, so there is an Arch Linux from Raspberry Pi, and that's quite the easiest way to go because all the dependencies are like latest things. You can even get the kit when you want. Uh, so, especially when we are talking about WLAN, uh, WLAN require to be really on, on the edge. It's not really, uh, like, the, the release are not really uh, that completely usable, so the more you are on the edge, the better it gets. So, yeah, I would recommend to go this way. Yeah? Uh, so, um, .NET is coming to Python. Yes. Uh, so EFL is, uh, right now, they are using it as uh, the backend toolkit of, uh, so .NET is uh, just using a uh, binding to EFL, and they are, as far as I know, writing the uh, C sharp forms, I, .NET forms, I don't remember what the names is, are uh, using uh, EFL below, uh, yeah. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> That's 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 as far as I know. I'm I'm just doing the support for the library there, so I don't exactly know where where they are go where they are. Uh, but that's what they were trying to do. Yeah. Uh, so there have been in the past uh, quite a few users of EFL in microcontroller. Uh, the latest uh, example I remember was a kind of a GPS device, uh, but that give you in Europe uh, where the uh, fixed radar are, and they were using EFL on, on it. It was a 16 megabyte uh, RAM device with no execute in place, and uh, some kind of cortex, uh, small cortex with no MMU. Uh, and and basically, the full system with EFL and the graphics was eight megabytes, and the application had uh, eight more megabytes. But there were some voice recognition included in that, so uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much, and bon appétit.